Uh, the reading today is from the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Colossians 3, first 14 verses, starting at verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. All right. Thank you, Wendell. So I just want to um, say real quickly here, I, I'm really looking forward to our time together in the, in the park this afternoon. I know this was announced, but we're having our just annual picnic slash um, meeting gathering for the the English congregation at Cheviot Hills Rec Center today. It'll just be after church. We'll start with a meal at 12. But really looking forward to just getting time, getting time together as a, as a church family. This is really for all of you who consider this your church family or are considering considering this your church family. But we would love to have you. Um, and, and this is a time for us to really... Uh, Seek the Lord together. Look to what He's done and what He's where He's taking us. Um, share things that God's put on our hearts in those areas. So, um, with that, uh, let me pray for us, and we'll dig into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for uh, for your presence here for this time that we have together. We offer it to you, Lord, and we we thank you that you are present, Lord, to to heal, present, to bring conviction, salvation, hope, deliverance, Lord. Help us to know, Lord, you're, that you're here and that you see us, that you know us as we are, and that there's power, Lord, in your word and in your spirit to transform our lives. Uh, we trust you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, um, we've been going through a series on, on Christian character, um, talking about how that's the end of what, that's, that's the the goal, the, the thing that God is doing in our lives. He's, he hasn't just left us here sort of waiting for him to come back, but he's, he's left us here and he's transforming us and making us like him. And we're going to look today at, at how he does that. How does, this, how does this kind of transformation take place? You know, I was um, 
I was listening to, sometimes I, I flip around on the radio. I'm in the car like way more than any sane person should be during the week. But um, yeah, I might, I might not be <laughs> sane some of the time. But anyhow, I'm in the car way too much. So I flip around the station sometimes. I'm listening to this program on NPR that had some education specialists talking about talking about like what's changed in education since the the pandemic and and they said well i think the biggest thing that we're we has changed and is a new frontier for us or is it, you know, they didn't use those words but something along those lines as they said before the pandemic everything was focused on academics we we have to get kids to to raise their level it was all test scores and academics and we've got to get kids to raise raise their test scores. We've got to learn, learn how to do a better job um, with equity in this area of academics. We've got to raise up folks that are marginalized so there's much more equality in education, yeah, but it was all focused on academics. And, and they said, now we're realizing all that, all that doesn't matter a whole lot if, if the kids can't, can't even be in a space together or, um, or have so much going on in their lives that they can't, they, they can't apply themselves and learn. So we're realizing we need to teach them, we need to teach them kindness. We need to teach them understanding. We need to teach them to listen to each other. We need to teach, and, and one of them used the word morality. We need to teach them morality. And I was just, I'm just listening to this and I'm like, wow. I'm, I'm shocked that, I, I mean, I'm not shocked they can't come to that conclusion, but, and then they gave a bunch of examples. But they realized, like, we're, we're not going to be able to, folks, kids are not going to be able to be developed in education or academically or otherwise unless they reach, un, unless they learn a bit of kindness and morality, which is a crazy thing to hear from our secular society. And the sad thing is there's not a lot of basis Right? There's not a lot of basis in the way we think about life, um, the philosophy of how we go about life in secular society to, to try to even call people to be moral. But I think we as Christians, we have Christians ha as Christians have all the basis, but sometimes this is, this is a hard thing in our lives. We face questions like, how do I really change? Can I really change? Can I really become a, a, a better person? Can I become a more kind person? Can I become a more loving person? Can, can I overcome hurts, habits, and hang-ups? Can I overcome things that uh, my, my anger, my, whatever your issues might be? We get stuck in all of those things. And as we, we, we think about this question, this, these questions of Christian character, um, we've, we've seen that this is what God's doing with us. This is what his plan is for us, but it's hard for us to believe a lot of times, can this really happen? Can we really, can we really become transformed people? And what we want to look at this morning is how Paul says a resounding yes to that. And it's interesting that in, in this Colossians, we won't, I won't go through a ton of the background, but Paul's saying just before this, he's bringing up philosophies in the secular world around them and in the religious world, and he says, you know, folks say, you know, don't touch this, don't, don't do this, you need to celebrate this, but don't celebrate that, and he says, none of that means anything. None of these philosophies are going to produce a change in your life, and that's kind of how he, he walks into this passage. And we have kind of a we have kind of some ugly stuff philosophy wise that we, we we face in the church you know in my in my generation there was a lot of a lot of sort of miscued stuff going on in the church around this idea of how transformation happens um, a, a fad I guess you could call it that that later described as I'm going to give you a couple of these as moralistic therapeutic deism how do you like that? Moralistic therapeutic deism. This was like, this was like a, basically um, a push to be moral people at, in the church, but to a certain level. And here's what they, here's, here's what happened is folks realized that our church was producing a lot, not our church, but the church in a lot of cases was producing this kind of people. 
people that believed that God wants people to be good, fair to others, and nice, and that the central goal of Christianity was to feel good about oneself and to be happy. And you still see that. You still see a, a bit of the remnants of that. You still see that in a lot of circles. And when we follow that kind of moral code, we'll go to heaven. That's, that's kind of the bottom line. And so what you had in churches was a whole bunch of people that some folks would call benignly kind. We're not benign because you're not going to make a difference in the world. You're not going to have an impact, but you're nice. Um, that's, not what, that, that's not what we're meant to be as a church. And then uh, maybe in reaction to that, we, we call that maybe we call that legalism get into that a tiny bit more in a second but maybe in reaction to that now we've got modern folks in the church that call any any kind of um uh, uh anytime someone would call a group to be moral or to be good to to be changed in character they would call it legalism. I'm sure there's folks that would call um, even the, the sermon that I'm giving now legalism because you just don't do that. Um, any call for people to become more moral or to follow any kind of law is, uh, is, is prejudice, they would say. There's a, there's a female theologian... Um, Jen Wilkins, who she's on staff, I think she's an executive director at the Village Church, um, Matt Chandler's church, and she coined this phrase um, pretty recently um, that she, she calls celebratory failureism. I, I really liked the word. I really liked the phrase, but celebratory failureism, but I think it's something that we see in the church now, and it's kind of a reaction to this therapeutic uh, this moralistic therapeutic deism and what what this is celebratory um, failureism is um, what she says essentially is that these folks correctly understand that we can't keep the law or moral code and we're going to fail at every attempt therefore one we don't we don't need to strive after becoming more righteous and two, we can celebrate even our failures because it makes God's grace that much bigger and better. And it's sort of like, ah, yeah, I, I, I failed again, but of course we're always going to. And that's, and, and that's kind of how we live our lives. And there's much of that, there's much of that in the church. In fact, um, you, you, you get pushback from folks if you, if you suggest that no, we're actually supposed to. Uh, we're, we're actually supposed to get victory over that stuff. What are you talking about? Don't you know about grace? And uh, she calls this celebratory failureism. Um, one of these. So, so we got two philosophies that are maybe on opposite sides of the spectrum. One of these essentially teaches that the only way to be transformed and become better people is to keep rules. That's the moralism. The other one teaches that the only way to be transformed and become better people is to recognize that we'll always fall short and hope that somehow God changes us. And that's some people's method. Like, you know what? I'm, I'm always going to mess up. And, and so... I'm not going to, I'm not going to try, but we sort of hope that somehow as I'm just, as I'm just coming to church, as I'm doing some, some things that are good for me, that somehow God will change me without me putting out much effort towards it. And what I want us to see, uh, Paul talked about several philosophies of his day that didn't work. They don't change us. And then he lays out for them, he's, this is one of the, the greatest passages in scripture that describe how transformation should come in our lives. Paul's telling them, here's how you can be transformed. And um, I, before we get into what Paul says, I want to I wanna make one distinction clear that comes out in these examples that I gave. We, we've got to make... Yeah, we got to make a couple things clear. One is that 
justification, this doctrine of justification, I'm going to use some shuns, so don't get scared. These are like big church words, but they're important to know. This doctrine of justification is important. So before someone says, wait, Scott, are, isn't it true that we can't, we can't live up to this moral code and we're going to fail at every turn and that's why we need the gospel? That's why we need God's grace? Yes, that's true. That's what justification tells us. Justification tells us that we, we are the only way we can be transformed, the only way that we're saved is because of God's grace and it's through faith alone. It's through trusting in what God has done for us alone. There is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. There is no works. It's not our track record. It's not our grades. It's, it's nothing of us that can save us. That's what justification tells us. We trust in what Christ did for us. But there's another part of the good news, and it's another shun. Sanctification. And what sanctification tells us, what the doctrine of sanctification tells us, is that this, um, this faith must result in a transformed life that becomes holy. So those who believe are being made holy. Um, another way to think about this, we're being restored to our original design and purpose. Now if you look at those two things, the first one, you can do absolutely nothing to earn that. And so we, we can never go about the Christian life saying, man, I, I got to try to do better so that God will be happier with me. He will not. He is pleased only with the righteousness of his son, what his son has done for you. There's nothing that you've done. There's nothing you can do to make yourself right and pleasing to God. It takes no effort on our part. Zero. But guess what? And there's no cost to us, actually. It's free. It's a free gift. But see, the second part of this, and this is the second part of the good news. It's good news because we're not stuck where we are. God is not leaving us stuck in a mess. He's changing us. But the good news about this part is different because this part we do have a role in. God does all the work in us, but he does it alongside of us. We choose to participate with him. We do it by faith, but it takes a lot of effort. And that's what we're going to see in, in, in what Paul tells us. It's very important that we, we understand those things. One of these two, justification, costs us nothing. Sanctification costs us everything. Everything. Why do I say that? Because if we're not willing to surrender everything, God, we're, we're not going to see transformation happen in our lives. But we surrender as a response to what God has done in our lives. That's why Jesus can say, uh, we, you know, it's by faith. That's why we're saved by faith alone. But at the same time, Jesus can say, no one follows after me unless they take up their cross unless they are willing to lose their own life. Why? Because it's going to cost you everything. And it's important for us to understand those two things. Hebrews, the author to Hebrews puts them together. Look what he says. I love this verse. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. He has made us perfect in our position, in our position of righteousness with God. But we are being made holy. Two things that are going on and they're related to each other. And they're both a part of the good news. I would say that, you know, this um, celebratory failureism wants to focus on justification and, and ignore sanctification. And we can't, that's not good news. And Paul's going Paul's to bring that out for us. Here's the logic of transformation that we see in Paul's writing. The logic of transformation. Here's what Paul says in, in the first verse. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. What Paul says is, 
because of what God has done in our position before him, because of justification, because of what has been accomplished for us, we ought to live that out in our experience, in our sanctification. In fact, I think Paul would say, if we believe what God has done for us, we will live this way. It will, it, we will live it out in our lives. Faith and works are not separate in that way, but they should go together. Since we've been raised with Christ. What does Paul even mean by that? Since we've been raised with Christ. What he means, Jesus, Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God. The right hand of power. What that means is he's, he has all authority. And then what this scripture says is that you have been raised with Christ. You're there with him. Seated with him. He has, he has lifted us up. He has, he has saved us. Our old, our old man was crucified with Christ on the cross. And he has raised us with Christ in his resurrection. Here's what it says in chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Paul goes into to more detail. He says, Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was, cut, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. This is what Christ has done for us. The work that we had nothing to do with, but it has been accomplished. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When we read that stuff, sometimes, I don't know about you, but my brain can go into sort of this symbolic mode. Okay, yeah, I, I, I was buried with him, and now I'm raised with him. And I, it's, it's, these are all symbols. What, we, what, what I want us to realize is that what Paul's saying here was actually accomplished. This is reality when we believe this. I think about Lazarus. Lazarus died. I mean, dead. Dead as a doornail. Four days in his tomb. And Jesus came and said, and said Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus had to take off. Uh, they told him to take off his grave clothes. He came out and he took off his grave clothes. That, that person, that old self that couldn't stop sinning, that was ad addicted and couldn't do otherwise than to mess up and sin, that self, when we, when we trust Christ, that self was crucified on the cross with Christ, buried with him. And then Christ calls us and says, come out, take off your grave clothes. We have been raised with Christ. This, this was accomplished for us. For Paul, believing doesn't just mean we trust God and then passively go with the flow from there. I, I, I hope God does what, I hope God does something with me. But faith and believing means that we have to live it out. Believing that this happened means I've got to make some choices about how I live. Now, imagine this. Um, we've, we've had a lot of people that have had some, uh, had some accidents, uh, had some injuries. We've got I Isaiah and, and Omar with, their, with their, knee, their knee issues. But imagine, imagine a situation that's more complicated. But you, you're, you're in an accident, and uh, for, for much time it looks likely that you'll never be able to walk again. You have an incredible doctor who performs an incredible surgery, and he says, look, I've done everything that needs to be done, and you're going to be able to walk again. That's, that's the good news. The, the rough news is it's going to be tough. It's, it's going to be tough. It's going to take all your energy. It's going to take all your strength. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to re, you're, you got to retrain your brain. you got to relearn some things that you're... you're that you're, you've lost the coordination, you've lost the strength, this is going to be mental, this is going to be physical, this is going to be heart, everything, but you're going to be able to walk again. That's, 
that would be amazing news, right? But imagine if we just said, imagine if as, a, as, as his patient, we said, thank you. And the doctor says, do you believe me? Yes. And, and we're, and then we go, and he says, he says, okay, here's what it's going to look like. Here's what you've got to do. You've got to start into this regimen. And, but we're like, man, that, that looks too crazy. That looks too tough. I, I do believe the doctor that I can walk again, but I'm just going to hope that it just happens. I'm going to just hope that, you know, I, I get up and I can just do this. That's, that's not faith. That's not believing the doctor. Believing the doctor is believing that he has done what he said he's going to do, but he's also, if we track with him, if we listen to him, if we trust him, we'll take the steps that he tells us need to be taken. And that's what, that's what Paul's laying out for us. For Paul, that's what it means. We can't just believe and, and not do anything. It wouldn't make any sense. Believing means taking some actions. Believing means doing something. And that leads us to the effort of transformation. And what Paul's going to tell us is how we can, how we can really attain a transformed character. And God has made a way for us. Um, what he starts out by saying in, in, in verse 5 he says, put to death, therefore, what, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And what, what I want us to see right away is that the character change, the transformation that, that we can expect in our lives is clearly going to take a lot of work. Paul starts out by saying, put to death. This is not an easy thing to do. You might wonder, and we, we, we might even be frustrated by the fact like, why, when I, when, I gave, when I give my life to Christ, why doesn't, why doesn't just all the junk go away? If he's really made me new, if I'm a new creation, why don't I just only desire what's good? Why, why isn't it just easy? No, but he's changed us and transformed us. That has happened. Your old self did die. There's a new creation that God's brought to life, but it doesn't mean your old habits, hang-ups, and hurts are gone. They're still there. You're still, you're still going to have those right in front of you. The difference is right now, Paul wants to tell us, you're, you're not a slave to them anymore. You don't have to obey them anymore. You have all those evil desires. You have all those habits, but you don't have to obey it anymore. You don't have to walk in that anymore. In fact, you've not only, you, you've not only been um, set free from those things, but I've given you my spirit so you have power to, to walk in a new way. But guess what? As much as we might wish that that stuff was just gone and we didn't have to battle, we didn't have to put out effort, we didn't have to overcome, we didn't have to fight, that's not the way it is. We've got to battle, and we've got to overcome some things. And so Paul says it, it looks like this. We put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature. And I want to say something. You know, when Paul says, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, he's not saying set your heart and your mind on the spirit and, and like physical things are bad. This is, he's saying, set your heart and mind on what God desires, on what God delights in, on what's centered around God, and not around our own appetites, our fleshly appetites. That's, that's the distinction there, and you can see it here. So he says, we've got to put those things to death. Our fleshly appetites are still strong in us. This takes more than just significant effort. It's going to require mental, physical, emotional effort, and a whole lot of it. Like the patient that wants to regain his walk, he wants to walk again. It's going to require us determining to do that. That's why Paul says, you better determine to do this. You better set your heart on it. You better set your mind on it. 
Because if you don't, you're not gonna, you're not gonna persevere. You're not gonna make it. The person who wants to walk again, who's had that surgery, better set their heart on walking again. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna push through, I'm gonna do it no matter what. And so Paul says, set your heart on it. And then he says, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. How do we do that? What does that even look like? What does that mean? We've got habitual thoughts and behaviors. We've got habits that have to be let go of. Um, I don't know about you, but it's... I experience all the time how hard it is to drop habits and start habits. Whenever I want to start exercising again, and I haven't for a while, I just know two weeks is going to be painful. Like, I have to, I have to force myself to run for, you know, every other day for two weeks, and it's going to stink. It's going to be painful. But once you get there, once you start getting the habit going, things change. It's hard to break habits. It's hard to start habits. But Paul says these things need to be put to death. Some of us, we want to start serving. We want to start doing good things. We want to start having good habits. Those need to happen. We ought to, we ought to implement those things. We ought to be starting to do those. These go hand in hand. But we're not going to get very far unless we're also putting some things to death. It's not easy to put things to death. It's not easy to put these kind of habits to death. These, these desires that come up in our hearts, the only way to put them to death is to starve them, let them die. And, you know, Paul says, Paul says in verse 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. In Romans, he tells us, consider yourself dead to these things. You might have those desires, but you consider yourself dead to them. What does that mean? Well, it means when they come up, I say, that's not me anymore. I, re I reject them. I set them aside. I, I got a desire to do something. I, I turn the other way, and I say, that's, I'm fleeing that. That's not me anymore. Now, this is who I am, and I'm, I'm pursuing Christ. I'm, I'm a servant of Christ. I'm doing what he asked me to do. And I do that over and over again until that desire gets smaller and smaller and smaller and until it dies. But we aren't going to get very far in our Christian life unless we learn how to put things to death. We're not going to get very far in transformation until we learn how to put things to death. And Paul's telling us, this is how you live a transformed life. One of the times in my life that I experienced the most radical growth in my character was after an extended period of failure in my Christian walk. Um, it, was, it was sin, repent, try again. Sin, repent, try again. Some of you have experienced this before. Rinse, repeat, autopilot, sin, repent, try again. And I was, I was getting so, so frustrated because I, I wanted desperately to, for that sin to be gone in my life. I wanted desperately to be able to serve the Lord. I couldn't, I couldn't get rid of it. And I felt awful about myself. I felt awful about who I was. And I got to a, I got to a real low place. I got to a real low place where I, I, I remember going out. I couldn't repent again. I just couldn't. I said, God, how can I, how can I even come to you? I've, I've come to you so many times. And, you know, all those, all those scriptures about, like, the unpardonable sins and stuff like that were the ones that seemed easiest to believe. Some of you have been there before. And I, I was sitting with God, and I said, God, I can't, I, 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 it's, I can't believe, I can't have faith right now that you would even accept me, that you would take me back. But I don't, I don't know what to do with myself. If I don't, if I don't, if I don't believe that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall apart. So even though I don't feel anything, 
even though I don't see anything, even though I've been crying out to you and I don't, I don't see any sign that you've answered me, I'm going to start, I'm going to start living as if, as if this is true, as if you accept me, as if, as if I'm not the horrible person I feel like I am, the messed up person that I feel like I am, but I'm going to start, I'm going to start just trusting that I'm loved and that you've made me new, that you've separated me to serve you, and I'm just going to start, start doing it because there's nothing else I can do. Just give me little things to do to serve you. I'll do anything. And then, man, God started changing me. I started having interactions with people where I used to, I used to see myself, people that look, look down on me, people that know stuff about my life, they know how messed up I am, and they see me in this certain way, and I no longer let that determine who I was. It's like, I, I, don't, I don't care the way you see me. I love you, man, and I love you because I just have to believe that God's changed me, and this is who I am now. And I was never as messed up a person as I was then, and yet God transformed me. I, day after day, I would have those kind of interactions, and then pretty soon it became more a part of who I was. New habits were forming, new ways of seeing myself, new ways of dressing myself spiritually. And the funny thing about it is, I... I I really, when I look back on it, like I, I felt like I was at my lowest moment of faith. But I was probably putting my faith in Christ for the first time in some, in some ways. It's crazy to think about. I was at my lowest point of faith. It was hard for me to believe that God could even accept me. But what, what I didn't realize is that faith is that choice. Faith is the choice to say, even though I don't feel it, I'm going to believe that you see me this way. Even though I don't feel it, your word says that you love me, I'm going to believe that you do. Even though I don't feel it, I'm going to believe that you've transformed my life and that I'm different and that now I'm set apart to serve you and I'm going to see myself that way. And when we do that, we choose, we choose to see ourselves that way. I'm going to choose to believe that I am, I am dead to those things and I'm not going to run to him anymore. I'm going to choose to believe that that's my old life and it's gone. When we choose those things, that's faith. That's exercising faith. And that's where change happens. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was putting on a new self. And God tells us to put on a new self. I, um, I can remember, I, I don't know, some of y'all, like, I, I just wear whatever I find in my closet. You, you, you all probably know that about me. I'm not too into clothes. But so, some people have told me how they're like, you know, they feel different ways depending on what they wear. And like, they have to choose what they wear because of how they want to feel in a given situation or circumstance. And I, I still kind of trip out about that. But that's okay. But the, the way I can relate to this is I was, um, I, I remember this um we were in an when i was playing little league i was on an all-star team that was really good um it was my last year in little league and we we went pretty far um and uh i that uniform i would just look at that uniform and i couldn't wait to put it on i felt different when i was wearing that i i felt different i had never played a, I, I mean at that level you know you're like 11 or i don't know how old i was but you know, I'm, I'm not used to this kind of thing. High schools do this all the time, but, but we would get places and like the team would know who I was. Like they studied up on our team and they knew us, they knew about us. And you, you wear this uniform and you're like, yeah, that's us. You know, this is, and, and you, it's, there's something about it, right? Something about the way you see yourself. There was something about the way I saw myself. When I, would wear, when I would wear that. And in that way, it, in, that, in that same sort of sense, Paul says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Put this on. See yourself as one 
representing God, bearing compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness. Actively, we have to actively choose that, choose to put that on in our relationships. And we do that. How does change happen? How does our character change? You might think, aren't we just faking that? Aren't we just, like, isn't what you're describing? Couldn't anyone do that? Isn't that insincere? And I would say two things to that. One is, it's insincere and hypocrisy if we got all kinds of stuff going on underneath that we were not willing to deal with. If, if, I've, if, got, if I've got all this junk and I act real nice and I'm like, man, I just, I, I just want to be there for you. But inside I'm like, I, I can't stand you. I judge you. I'm bitter towards you. But I'm going to smile. That's hypocrisy. That's ugly. But I'll tell you, if, if we're putting off our old self, dealing with all those things, putting on Christ, there's nothing more sincere, no way that's more sincere that we could live. Because that's who we are. That's who Christ has made us. And when we do that, we do it over and over and over again, it becomes habit. It becomes a part of our character. It becomes something we do without trying to put on our clothes. I don't need to try to see myself a certain way. That's how Paul says our, our Christian character can be transformed. It's possible for us to be transformed. But it takes believing in what Christ has done. And because he's done that, it takes choosing to believe, choosing to live in a different way. Our beliefs and our obedience have to go together. We can't settle for saying, you know what, I failed and I'll always fail. And this is just the way I'm going to be. This is just the way I'm going to take it or leave it. This is just who I am. I, I hope God does something with me. That's, that's not how we're called to live. We don't, go with the, we don't just go with the flow. Because God has done a tremendous work in us, because he said you can walk, because he said you can live, because he said you are, you're alive, we got to come out of the grave, we got to take off our grave clothes, and we got to put on the clothes he's given us. And we've got to say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to determine to do this, I'm going to determine for God to accomplish his work in me, for all this sin to be, to be, to be taken from me, to be put to death. And for me to be able to become the person that God has created me to be, I'm going to go after that. I'm going to determine to, and I'm not going to give up. And, you know, the last thing I want to share as we go into communion is that the community aspect of transformation. This happens in community. Like we said about CR, you can't do this alone. You cannot become this kind of person alone. It's, it's interesting when you look at this passage. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's, that's what Christ has shown us. God hasn't just come and told us, he hasn't just come and told us, hey, you got grace. It's okay. Mess up however much you want to mess up. And it, you got, there's grace for you. He hasn't just done that. He's given us grace, but he's also given us so much grace that he said, I can't leave you where you are. And so he walks, he walks with us with a perfect blend of compassion, gentleness, kindness, and humility. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to leave us where we are. He's going to help us move forward, but, uh, but he's going to do it with gentleness and patience and love. And then he calls us to do that for each other. Why does he say forgive one another? Forgive as the Lord forgave you, because in this community, we're going to need to exercise forgiveness. We're going to need to be, receive forgiveness from Christ and to forgive others. Help them to come into who Christ is making them. I'm going to um, invite 
invite uh, Isaiah up, and uh, I think Sarah and Wendell are going to take communion. But as we, as we look at the, the bread and the cup, We're, we're, we're told to remember what Christ has done for us on the cross. And when we look at the cross, what it speaks to us, it speaks to us about how, how much God loves us, his patient, incredible, enduring love, his steadfastness. Man, he, he forgave me falling again and again and again and again and was patient with me and didn't give up on me. It doesn't matter how many times you fall. It doesn't matter how, how messed up you are, how much of a mess you are. Christ went all the way to the cross for you. But see, it also tells us how much we need him, how much we need to be changed. It's because of what he's done that we live differently. But we can't, we can't look at what Christ has done for us and say, thank you for spilling your blood. Thank you for giving everything. Thank you for loving me as much as you did. Now I'm, I'm going to, you know, when I, when I have time, I'm going to come to church and maybe give you a buck or two. Thanks, God. But that's not a response to what Christ has done for us. The response is, is to lay ourselves down and say, Jesus, I want you to have your way with me. I want to be who you've made me to be. I want you to accomplish all, all that you died to accomplish in my life. And I trust and believe that you're able to. Father, I thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us on the cross. Lord, that you've made a way for us to be transformed and to be changed. Help us to trust you, Lord. Help us to believe that. Help us to receive power, Lord, to, to walk in newness of life. And help us to do it as a community, Lord. Help us to love one another and help each other be transformed, Lord, that we might, we might reflect who you are, Lord, to the world around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.